And we are here at the Antonov Airport, which is about 25 kilometers, 15 miles or so out of the center. These troops you can see over here. Stand up, Lewis. These troops you can see over here, they are Russian airborne forces. They have taken this airport. I've spoken to the commander on the ground there within the past few minutes, and he said they are now in control of this airport. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. Well, that was a gutsy live cross from CNN's Matthew Chance last Friday, showing Russian troops on the outskirts of the Ukrainian capital only 24 hours into the brutal invasion that shocked and frightened the world. And, as Chance soon discovered, reporting from the battlefront can be a risky business. Keep inside, keep inside, inside, in here, here. Against the how wall. Can I, how can I fight? That's not the only moment CNN's experienced team of journalists, at least eight of whom are on the front line, was bringing us eyewitness accounts of Putin's brazen assault. They also showed us Russian rockets passing overhead and advancing Russian tanks. Those vehicles are clearly now moving forward towards the territory of Ukraine. It was amazing stuff, and there's been plenty more dramatic footage on social media as ordinary Ukrainians have defied the invaders. Like this lone man trying to block a Russian tank. Or these residents from the town of Chernihiu doing the same. We've also seen the reported destruction of a Russian armoured convoy by Ukrainian forces on the outskirts of the capital. And this remarkable clip of a Ukrainian driver stopping alongside a Russian tank and offering some free advice. <laughs> All this and more was filmed on mobile phones and uploaded to the net for the world to bear witness. As were these video messages from the Ukrainian president rallying his citizens to fight. And this one aimed at countering fake news. Зараз мережі дуже багато з'явилось фейкової інформації, що немов я закликаю складати зброю в нашу армію і йде евакуація. Будемо захищати нашу державу, тому що наша зброя це наша правда. But in the rush to make sense of the battle as it unfolded, there were inevitable slip-ups, especially in Thursday's 6 p.m. bulletins back in Australia, which had only three hours to react after Putin's invasion began. And inside the holy grail of Putin's ambitions, the Ukrainian capital, Kiev. Seven News gave us that ominous display of Russian military might and showed it again on the late news that night. But if you thought that formation of ten fighter jets looked a little bit sus, well, you'd be right. Because the original footage is of a Moscow air parade two years ago. And the air raid siren has been dubbed on top. So, Russian jets, yes, but not over Kiev not invading Ukraine, and not from last week. So where did it come from? Twitter, of course. And this Moscow account, set up in November, called Russia Attacks, claiming... This morning in Kiev. And Seven was not the only network to be tricked by the barrage of bogus images on social media. Tens the project was also caught out. Multiple explosions in the cities of Kiev and Kharkiv. That was also wrong. It's a chemical storage facility exploding in the Chinese port of Tianjin in 2015, as you can see from this Guardian video at the time. Whoa! Holy shit! Did you get that? Fuck you! Yeah. And on the ABC 730, a snippet of grainy footage supposedly of Ukraine turns out to be a TikTok video posted last month called Lightning Strike at Power Station. In the fog of war, it's hard to know what's new or old, real or fake. But while those are mainly accidental, Russian journalist Tatyana Kukareva, who works for the Russian-owned news agency Sputnik, was serving up deliberate lies and laughable propaganda. There has not been any proof of actual troops going into Ukraine, and the Ministry of Defence has stated clearly that this operation, which you cannot truly classify as an invasion because, again, there are no troops on the ground, has been targeting military targets within Ukraine. You can't be serious. If you're, if, this is not an invasion. I want to ask you why this is not an invasion, what we're seeing now. The and for those who wanted more, Russian mouthpiece Pravda was serving up a mess of pro-Russian pap as the invasion unfolded. As for independent Russian media, it is being warned not to use words like war, invasion or assault when reporting on Ukraine. As Moscow's Daily Beast reporter Anna Nemtsova told ABC Radio... 
the world war was banned in Russia and uh, all the media, independent media that use that word are now obliged to take down their, their publications, their, their articles, like a very famous face of Channel One. Ivan Urgant said no to war, and he lost his show, the late-night show. He was a Russian called there. There is no show on Channel One anymore. But one talk show host is still winning fans with Russian authorities, Fox News superstar Tucker Carlson, who initially called the Ukraine-Russia tensions a border dispute and who offered this defence of Putin just hours before the tanks roll in. It might be worth asking yourself, since it is getting pretty serious, what is this really about? Why do I hate Putin so much? Has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? Has he shipped every middle-class job in my town to Russia? Did he manufacture a worldwide pandemic that wrecked my business and kept me indoors for two years? Is he teaching my children to embrace racial discrimination? Is he making fentanyl? Is he trying to snuff out Christianity? Does he eat dogs? These are fair questions, and the answer to all of them is no. Vladimir Putin didn't do any of that. So why does permanent Washington hate him so much? The Russians love that clip so much, it was broadcast on Russia Today, the Kremlin-backed broadcaster, complete with Russian subtitles, and took pride of place on RT's website. Tucker Carlson wonders why US elites hate Putin. Well, Tucker, just ask the people of Ukraine and the friends and families of those who are dying to defend it. But now, to a more trivial battle, thankfully involving only words, between rival media outlets over an extraordinary story featuring drugs, sex, lies and extortion. The chief executive of a major alcohol company has suddenly quit sending its shares plummeting after video emerged of him appearing to be smoking drugs. It's not the typical video of a CEO and board member. I smoke meth and just blow it all over again. Jeff Bainbridge, chief of whiskey company Lark Distillers, victim, he says, of an extraordinary extortion. That report on 7 News last Wednesday was following up on a scoop by the Australians Sherry Markson and Kyla Lusikian, which had broken on Twitter at 11am that morning. Exclusive, the CEO of an ASX-listed company has resigned after the Australian obtained an explicit video in which he appears to be smoking a meth pipe. And explicit it was, with the Australian's video showing Lark CEO Jeff Bainbridge dressed in his underpants, talking dirty and blowing out clouds of smoke. Hi together, baby. You'd be just like, oh, it would be so hot. You know, f me, Dad. I'd smoke meth and just blow it all over you. Two more embarrassing videos of Bainbridge allegedly masturbating and watching hardcore pornography were not released. But an hour after the story went up on social media, the chief reporter at The Age, Chip Legrand, was savaging Markson's exclusive, claiming... The criminals who extorted Jeff Bainbridge threatened to give Australian media outlets damaging video footage of him. Evidently, they have. The truly remarkable story is how it came to this. And remarkable is the word, if it was true. As The Age told the tale... For the past six years, public humiliation and shame has stalked Melbourne entrepreneur Jeff Bainbridge. A day ago, the latest WhatsApp message from an all-too-familiar mobile phone number warned that unless he paid up, time was running out. Tick-tock, little man. It read. Bainbridge had refused to talk to Shari Markson when she approached him for comment 24 hours earlier. But the businessman now told Legrand a tale of woe that painted him as an almost innocent victim, describing... An extortion racket that began in December 2015, when he awoke in an unfamiliar apartment to find two strange men with video footage showing what he'd done the night before. The apartment was supposedly in Southeast Asia, where Bainbridge was on a business trip. He'd met a woman in a bar, gone back for a drink, smoked a joint, and after that, Legrand told readers it was all a blur. He confirms it is him in the video, but says he isn't an ICE user and doesn't know how he came to have the drug or what else he was given. It was one hell of a story. A bad decision that ruined a life and a newspaper apparently doing the work of blackmailers. And on Markson's social media page, her enemies were soon having a field day. Perhaps Shari needs to look up the word complicit. This is such a grubby attempt at journalism. You knew a criminal syndicate was using this video to extort money, and you published anyway? But was it really so simple? And how true was the story of the Asian shakedown? Markson's response in The Australian next day suggested it wasn't. 
My sources say the videos were filmed more recently. The Age, Suspending Belief, published without evidence a claim by Bainbridge that the extortionists were so technically proficient that they have managed to alter the date stamp on one of the videos to make it appear as if it was captured in 2021 and not in 2015. The unpublished videos offer a different version of events. Then last Monday came this bombshell revelation from the Herald Sun. New pics cast doubt on where Jeff Bainbridge video was filmed. Bainbridge claimed the video was filmed during a wild night out in Asia, but our spies say it was more likely a Middle Park bedroom than a bad night in a Bangkok hotel. The video published by The Australian showed a distinctive light fitting in the background. And a little bit of sleuthing by the Herald Sun revealed a match with real estate pictures of a house in Melbourne, bought by Bainbridge some 18 months ago. Cue for Markson to get stuck into the businessman and all who had believed him. His well-scripted story, provided to The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald, and dutifully reported by media outlets The Guardian, The Australian Financial Review and Seven, documented a horror tale overseas that haunted him for years. However, the new evidence uncovered by The Australian suggests clearly that his story is a total fabrication. Well, perhaps not a total fabrication, but more than enough. Clearly, Bainbridge had lied and Legrand had been taken for a ride. So, presumably, he then apologised. Well, no. Instead, he published a news story saying the age had been misled, but avoiding the words, sorry, I was fooled, or I should have checked. Nor did he admit that he should have rung Sherry Markson before publishing his article to see what she had to say. And soon, the Australian's Christine Lacey, under the headline... The age's reputation goes up in smoke with Jeff Bainbridge. ..was chiding him for the mistake. It was a tour de force in why it was a bad idea to publish with just one side of the story. And citing former Age Editor-in-Chief Ranald McDonald's admission to a Facebook group of Age alumni that he was, quote... ..appalled by the pathetic Chip Legrand article about the Lark Chief Executive story. And suggesting that the Age was, quote... ..just conned and motivated by discrediting the Australian story. All associates should be ashamed from the editor down. The Age has now removed the story. So we asked Legrand and his editor, Gay Alcorn, if they plan to take any responsibility for the debacle. And they told us... We have undertaken an investigation into what went wrong with this story. Anything we can learn from it, we will. We take full responsibility. And so they should. But now, let's wind the clock back to last Monday, when Australia reopened its international borders. On the very day our biggest city woke up to transport mayhem. Breaking now, Sydney train strikes snap industrial action. It's been a nightmare morning for Sydney commuters with the entire train network brought to a halt as drivers strike. These pictures just in. This is bumper to bumper Whoa. traffic in Sydney after the city's train network shut down. Strike announced at 2am this morning. Yes, on 7, 9 and 10, we were told it was strike, strike, strike. And over on the ABC, on radio and TV, the narrative was the same. Also breaking this morning, a snap train strike across New South Wales leaves hundreds of thousands facing a chaotic start to the working week. Meanwhile, the state government was busy ramming home that message, with New South Wales Transport Minister David Elliott sheeting home the blame for the disruption to the unions and Labor. What we've seen today is nothing short of industrial bastardry. This is not anything but a part of the Labor Party's campaign to uh, bully the electorate into supporting uh, their, their election. And over on 2GB, the Prime Minister was adding his voice to the chorus of criticism. The unions are ramping up, there's no doubt about that, and it's a foretaste of what they could expect, I, I suspect, um, with, with licence from Labor. Meanwhile, Nine's Sydney Morning Herald was also blaming the rail shutdown on a strike by workers. And the paper's newly minted leader, former Canberra editor and European correspondent Bevan Shields, was backing it up on Twitter by quoting the state government's anti-union line. This is industrial bastardy of the worst form. Sydney hit by snap train strike. But social media was soon firing back with claims that the union had not walked off the job at all. Maybe get your head around industrial law. Not a strike, it's a lockout. Not actually a strike, akin to what Alan Joyce did in 2011 when he grounded the entire global fleet. This is pretty bad reporting, especially not correcting it. If your editor sees this, you'll be... Oh, wait. And when union boss Alex Classens faced reporters, he was adamant that his members were not to blame. This is not a strike. 
We are not on strike. All of the people behind me, all the people sitting in the meal rooms all across the network are ready to work at a minute's notice. Uh, we're all there. We're ready to do the work as we agreed in the Commission late on Saturday night. And that was correct. The state government had shut the network down, supposedly for safety reasons, in response to the union's threat to work to rule. And it was not a snap decision. As we later discovered, the government was preparing for the shutdown for days. So why did the media get it wrong and fall for the government's spin? Incompetence, bias or a mixture of both? According to Tim Dunlop, a veteran journalist, commentator and media academic, the SMH's coverage was bad. Such an error is not just a failure of fact, it is deeply political. And I think it sheds a light on the presumptions that underpin the way news is written and presented. Seems all the media have now changed their line. But shame they got it wrong in the first place. And double shame on Herald editor Bevan Shields, who, according to these widely shared internal messages, was told by reporter Sarah McPhee... It's not technically a strike. The government says the union essentially made it unsafe to run the network today, hence using industrial action. To which Shields responded... It's a strike. But in the end, his reporting team forced him to change his stance. And finally tonight, as thousands flee fighting in Ukraine and Russian tanks surround the capital, let's hear from one veteran US celebrity on daytime talk show The View, who last week confessed to her own anxieties about the future. Well, I'm scared of what's going to happen in, in Western Europe, too. Yeah. Well, you know, you just you plan a trip, you want to go there, I want to go to Italy for four years. I haven't been able to make it because of, of uh, the pandemic. And now this, you know, it's, yeah. it's like, who's gonna, what's going to happen there? Joy Behar is a well-known US comedian, but that was not a joke. That's all from us tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream or download the program and read a full statement from The Age. Now, don't forget, Media Bites every Thursday. But for now, until next week, goodbye.